welcome and a very good afternoon to all of you. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome you this afternoon to BIPS Roundtable on the future of strategic competition in the Indian Ocean and its implication for South Asia. As a matter of fact, Bangladesh as a key maritime nation needs to understand the strategic implications of the Indian Ocean and the Indian Ocean Dream Area. It is in our interest that we leverage the key strategic imperatives that Bangladesh has as a Bay of Bengal country and a key maritime nation. So to deliberate on these issues, we are holding this round table this afternoon with a very distinguished speaker. I shall very shortly come to his biography. We also wanted to live tweet the event like we always do in BIPs, but unfortunately, the government has shut down Twitter and many other social media platforms today. So we are unable to live tweet on the Twitter handle that you see on the bottom of the screen. I would also like to say that the maritime issues, particularly of the Indian Ocean area, is a key research agenda of my institute. We are also the partner with the US Navy in holding maritime dialogue on a yearly basis. The last dialogue was held with the US Navy and Bangladesh Navy with sponsors BIPS and Center for Naval Analysis, which is a Pentagon think tank in Washington DC last year. I'm happy to say that the next dialogue will be held in Bangladesh in 2016 in March, and the third dialogue is being held in Hawaii with the Pacific Command. So therefore, the area and the subjects of the deliberation this afternoon is of key interest to the work agenda of my institute. Now, briefly to introduce the speaker this afternoon, Dr. Iskandar Rahman is a postdoctoral fellow in the project of international order and strategy at the Brookings Institutions in Washington, DC. Prior to joining Brookings, Dr. Rahman was a research fellow at the Center for Strategy and Budgetary Assessments, where he focused on US grant strategy, Asian defense uses, and emerging security challenges in the Indo-Pacific. From 2012 to 2013, Dr. Rahman was a Stanton Fellow in the Nuclear Policy Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. A Franco-British citizen, Dr. Rahman has lived and worked in France, India, and United States. He holds a doctoral in political science with distinctions and specialization in Asian studies and a master degree in political science, as well as a master degree in comparative politics. With that very brief introduction to a very illustrious speaker, Dr. Ramani of the floor. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to start off by thanking uh, BIPSS, uh, the general, and uh, Shafka Munir for inviting me here today and for organizing this round table. This is actually my, my first time in Bangladesh. Um, I'm very, very happy to be here. And um, while I'm excited about giving this presentation, I'm even more excited about learning from your perspectives and getting a sense of how these unfolding dynamics that I'm going to describe are viewed here in Dhaka. So in 2009, Robert D. Kaplan, who's a well-known US commentator, released a seminal article in the journal of Foreign Affairs on the Indian Ocean, which he predicted would emerge as the center stage for great power rivalries in the 21st century. In particular, Kaplan envisioned the, emergent, oh, sorry, the emergence of a maritime variant of the Great Game, whereby Asia's two great rising powers, India and China, would vie for control over access to energy supplies and the world's main sea lines of communication and engage in a shadowy struggle for influence among smaller Indian Ocean states. The United States, he predicted, would need to act shrewdly to forestall conflict, both cushioning the effects of its own relative decline and supporting India's emergence as a major naval actor. Um, uh, all without unduly antagonizing um, an increasingly resource-starved and powerful China. But more than half a decade later, however, it remains unclear whether the center of gravity for strategic competition has really drifted west of the Malacca Strait. 
The focus of both China and the US's operational planning and force deployment remains squarely focused on East Asia and on the increasingly contested waters surrounding Taiwan and Japan in particular. And for many, China's entry into the Indian Ocean has been more tentative and incremental than initially anticipated. And meanwhile, two years ago, Robert D. Kaplan uh, released another book, this time entitled Asia's Cauldron, The South China Sea and the End of the Stable Pacific, and which now made the claim that, I quote, just as German soil constituted the military front line of the Cold War, the waters of the South China Sea may constitute the military front line of the coming decades. So what should one make of these seemingly contradictory prognosis? Is the world's epicenter of rivalry no longer considered to be the Indian Ocean, but rather the South China Sea? Or perhaps what with recent events, it is not to be found in Asia at all, but rather in Syria, where a bewildering array of actors are fighting vicious proxy wars? Or maybe the true dangers lie along Europe's eastern periphery, where tensions have continued to grow between Ukraine, Russia, and several smaller NATO members. In short, were all these predictions of taut geopolitical rivalries, nervous naval jostling, and silent sparring for influence overblown, misplaced, or simply premature? So to find out, I'm going to use my time here today uh, to ask a series of questions, um, not so much with the goal of providing definitive answers, but with rather the hope of providing a panoramic view of some of the issues at stake so that we can then dive down into the weeds during the discussion session. And in this spirit here, I think, are some of the main questions that come to mind when one thinks of rivalry in the Indian Ocean. First, what are China's true intentions in the Indian Ocean? Can one point to a coherent structure of Chinese grand strategy for the Indian Ocean? Or is Beijing's policy toward the region pursued on an ad hoc basis? Are there differing schools of thought in Beijing with regard to the strategic importance of the Indian Ocean and the nature of China's future military presence there? Are Indian decision makers really that concerned about China's entry into the Indian Ocean? And if so, what steps are they taking in order to mitigate these strategic anxieties? Meanwhile, how does the Indian Ocean factor into the US's operational planning? And what role do planners in Washington see New Delhi playing in the wider region? Last but not least, how do all these developments affect other smaller and mid-sized powers in the region, such as Bangladesh. The one thing I've noticed is that in Washington and Western, capital, and Western capitals in general, there's a lot of commentary on India and China, Asia's two great rising powers, but very few people pay attention to middle powers, such as Sri Lanka or Bangladesh. And when they do, it's generally, it's generally through the lens of development or human rights issues. One of the reasons why I've traveled to Bangladesh is, uh, is, to get a is to get a better understanding of how you guys view all these developments from your vantage point in the Bay of Bengal. Um, so my talk today is going to be divided into three main sections. First, I'm going to analyze China's growing presence in the Indian Ocean and draw attention to an important grand strategic debate in Beijing. I'll also very briefly summarize how Chinese strategists perceive India's growing maritime ambitions. I'll then move on to explore how the United States, which remains the Indian Ocean's preeminent naval power, views both the Indian Ocean and India's naval rise. And I'm going to make the argument that an intensification of the Sino-US military rivalry in the Western Pacific could have important spillover effects in the Indian Ocean, and that could in turn dramatically transform the regional security environment. Throughout the presentation, I'm going to try and keep in mind the fact that this is a region with a very complex, multi-layered strategic geometry, and that it cannot be reduced to a simple set of bilateral rivalries. As the international relations theorist William Thompson has noted, we all too frequently fail to take into account the existence of what he refers to as entangled rivalries, noting that, I quote, one of the ironies in studying rivalries is that although analyzing specific dyads may be preferable to looking at monadic foreign policies, international relations are not necessarily conducted in pairs. A feuding pair of states rarely occurs in a vacuum. Both sides in a rivalry may attempt to pull other actors into their feud so as to gain advantage. To the extent that these other actors are also involved in rivalries of their own, rivalries are apt to become interconnected or entangled. And these observations, I think, are particularly true uh, when it comes to South Asia and the Indo-Pacific region more broadly. And I'll end my presentation by trying to get a sense of what all these moving parts mean for countries such as Bangladesh or Sri Lanka, which wish to focus on their own development all while protecting their sovereignty and preserving a modicum of strategic autonomy. 
So since its initial counter piracy operations in the Gulf of Aden in 2008, Beijing has deployed 21 different naval task forces. And the PLAN, the Chinese Navy, has become a regular presence in the Western Indian Ocean. Some of these developments have spanned eight months, which is longer than many US surface patrols, showcasing Beijing's ability to sustain extended and continuous extra-regional naval operations. And while these deployments have been framed primarily as custodial operations, they have also enabled Chinese sailors to become more experienced in the conduct of what one would call blue water operations. They've also allowed Chinese naval intelligence units to better map the region while expanding their knowledge of complex underwater topography and bathymetric conditions. Indeed, according to the US Department of Defense, the PLAN began in 2012 to formally deploy maritime intelligence collection vessels in the Indian Ocean. Chinese nuclear attack submarines have also embarked on extended patrols in the Indian Ocean, and conventional diesel electric submarines have begun to utilize ports in Indian Ocean states such as Sri Lanka for berthing and replenishment. By and large, however, China's naval presence in the Indian Ocean has been relatively limited in scale and a far cry from some of the more alarmist predictions in the Indian press, for example. China has thus opted for a strategy of places rather than bases, multiplying port calls in countries as varied as Yemen, Iran, Djibouti, and the Seychelles, amongst others. A lot has been said on China's involvement in all kinds of infrastructure projects around the Indian Ocean Basin, whether here in Bangladesh or elsewhere. And I'm not therefore going to provide yet another comprehensive catalog of China's infrastructural undertakings in the Indian Ocean. Rather, what I'm going to try and do is tease out some of the strategic and economic imperatives that drive these investments. And energy and commodity security are quite evidently key drivers in this regard. Chinese leaders are particularly concerned over the Malacca dilemma, the fact that the geography of the Indian Ocean Basin funnels the flow of seaborne trade to and from China through a few choke points at which it could, in theory, be interdicted with relative ease. In 2013, China overtook the United States and became the world's first oil importer. 43% of China's energy imports flow out the narrow mouth of the Persian Gulf, while fully 85% transit the heavily trafficked Strait of Malacca. And China is projected to see its demand for oil grow from 11 to 21 million barrels per day by 2030. 75% of this demand will need to be met by imports. And as is currently the case, most of these imports will probably be sourced from the Persian Gulf and East Africa and transit the Indian Ocean in tankers. As China's portion of arable land continues to dwindle due to desertification and a growing lack of water supplies, its dependence on imported food products is also likely to grow. Another driver which is sometimes overlooked is China's growing presence in Africa and in the eastern and central portions of the continent in particular. Foreign analysis of China's involvement in, Af in, in, in Africa are frequently somewhat reductionist, viewing the relationship as a little bit more, uh, as little more than a Chinese grant for resources. It's certainly true that China relies increasingly on African natural resources to fuel its growing economy, and that decision makers in Beijing are acutely aware of the fact that oil and gas production in Africa is expected to grow faster than in other parts of the world. And it is true that as a result, China is investing heavily in oil extraction in countries such as Sudan, Angola, and Nigeria. Beijing's focus on Africa is not only guided by a voracious appetite for resources, however, but also by the fact that the continent also presents a huge market for Chinese goods. Investment in Africa can potentially facilitate China's efforts to restructure its own economy away from labor-intensive industries, especially as labor costs in China increase. So these two factors, uh, feeding Chinese energy needs and absorbing Chinese exports, remain the central drivers of China's engagement with Africa. And China is clearly thinking long term when it comes to Africa and laying the groundwork for an enduring presence on the continent. Although Beijing has often been accused and for good cause of a callous disregard for human rights and of a depressingly mercantilistic approach to arms sales, it has also begun to demonstrate over recent years a growing commitment to African stability. Indeed, the uh, People's Republic of China now contributes more to UN peacekeeping operations in Africa than any other member of the P5. Beijing is also heavily investing in infrastructure projects in East African and Indian Ocean states, recently signing a deal to develop the Kenyan Port of Lamu, and formalizing an agreement to develop a vast railway network stretching from Kenya to South Sudan. China's activities in the Indian Ocean should also be viewed through the lens of its Go West strategy. For more than a decade, China's leadership has striven under the aegis of the Grand Western Development Program 
to better connect its more impoverished and relative uh, and restive uh, Western hinterlands to the rest of Asia. And by pouring funds and infrastructural efforts into the development of a transportation grid across South and Central Asia, Beijing hopes to provide a greater degree of trade and connectivity to provinces remote from the nation's east-facing strategic centers, such as Tibet, Xinjiang, and Yunnan, while circumventing narrow and heavily trafficked choke points. Meanwhile, the rise of China's navy has attracted a lot of attention. Until relatively recently, China was perceived as being first and foremost a continental power, whose strategic priorities were on land rather than at sea. And indeed, barring a few bursts of naval activity, such as during the Ming Dynasty, China's military history largely unfolded ashore. For much of the Cold War, China's strategic attention was captured by the long desolate frontier of the Soviet Union, with whom it fought a brief border war in 1969. The end of the Cold War and the resolution of territorial disputes with Russia have, however, led to a drastic dilution of China's continental threat perception. While one could reel off a whole list of additional economic and geopolitical factors driving China's turn seaward, there's little doubt in my mind that the alleviation of the bulk of China's continental concerns have played an enormous role in China's maritime transformation, enabling a greater degree of maritime focus than ever before. Uh, Chinese commentators regularly emphasize China's perceived need for a two-ocean Indo-Pacific Navy, and China's most recent defense white paper re-emphasizes the fact that China is now a major maritime as well as a land power. So the Chinese Navy now boasts the largest fleet in Asia, with some 79 principal surface combatants, 55 submarines, and a multitude of smaller combatants. China's rapidly expanding fleet, which in times of war would operate under the protective dome of an increasingly formidable anti-access and area denial complex composed of shore-based anti-ship missiles and advanced air defenses, has raised concerns over the ability of the US and its partners to preserve a stabilizing balance of forces in the region. And these concerns have been compounded by the devastating effects of budgetary turmoil in the US, which has led to the grounding of fighter squadrons and resulted in a decline in the availability of so-called surge forces, naval amphibious or carrier task forces available to deploy rapidly on short measures. The gradual erosion of the US's conventional edge in China's near waters may already be revealing its insidious effects as Beijing increasingly feels emboldened to assert dubious legalistic claims and engage in acts of coercive maritime maneuvering. China's renewed assertiveness when combined with the steady erosion of American conventional military superiority has led many to assume that the Indo-Pacific maritime theater will become the future epicenter of great power rivalry. Within China itself, however, many have questioned the wisdom of their nation's vigorous naval turn, and the rising power's future geopolitical orientation remains a subject of heated debate. Some influential Chinese strategists, such as Wang Jixi, have argued that Beijing should enact a pivot of its own, swiveling its focus away from crowded and increasingly contested waters and towards the supposedly more tranquil hinterlands of Central Asia. Others have touted the role China's high-speed railway system could play in developing the Chinese heartland and projecting influence deep into Eurasia. With the announcement of the much-heralded uh, One Belt, One Road project and the Maritime Silk Road Initiative, the debate seems to have been more or less resolved in the public domain, with China deciding to pursue both strategies simultaneously. That being said, there are indications that such discussions subsist and are not solely confined to the ivory towers of academia. PLA generals and PLAN admirals have publicly clashed over China's future grand strategic trajectory. And as China's navy gradually absorbs a higher portion of China's defense budget, this will undoubtedly raise hackles among the formerly privileged land forces. The Chinese regime's growing expenditures on internal security, which are now estimated to be superior to those granted to external defense, has also led to the meteoric rise in importance and influence of the paramilitary, an important evolution within China's security architecture that is often overlooked by foreign observers. So um, a brief note here on India's naval rise. Um, as you know, by virtue of being its close neighbor, the Indian Navy has been pursuing an ambitious modernization program for a while now. Um, it's currently, depending on what metrics you look at, the fifth largest maritime force in the world and as of early 2015, possesses two aircraft carriers, one nuclear-powered attack submarine, 14 conventional submarines, eight destroyers, and 15 frigates. Over the past decade, the Indian Navy has added a variety of other high-end assets to its inventory, ranging from sophisticated long-range maritime patrol aircraft, fourth-generation fighter jets, etc., etc. 
Yes. Within the next 10 years, the Indian Navy hopes to boast uh, a fleet of 200 warships and 300 aircraft structured around three carriers, two of which will then be domestically produced. That being said, the Indian Navy's modernization has been consistently hampered or delayed, if you will, uh, by a number of bureaucratic and infrastructural issues. And although it remains a highly capable force, it remains far smaller than its Chinese counterpart. Since independence, India's perception of extra-regional naval activity in the Indian Ocean has been strongly colored by a mixture of circumspection and mistrust. This was particularly true during certain periods of the Cold War, when Indian decision makers fretted over their country's continued vulnerability to gunboat, to gunboat diplomacy. And India's present anxieties with regard to the future of Chinese future naval presence in the Indian Ocean are somewhat more multifaceted and complex. China's port infrastructure projects and some of the countries closest to India, such as Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka, are cause for concern, as are its vigorous efforts to port a number of small strategically located island states in the Indian Ocean. However, while the tone of India's journalistic commentary is frequently somewhat sensationalistic, government documents and officials are somewhat more temperate. In today's increasingly globalized and interconnected world, there is a recognition that there is little that New Delhi can do to stop the deepening of Beijing's ties with its neighbors, apart from intensifying its own efforts to outbid China by floating its own increasingly generous offers of trade, investment, and military assistance. As one former Indian chief of naval staff, Admiral Arun Prakash, has argued, I quote, the appropriate counter to China's encirclement of India is to build our own relations, particularly in our neighborhood, on the basis of our national interests and generosity towards smaller neighbors. Under Modi's leadership, we have started to see this, as well as a particular focus on the Indian island's ocean states. And we've also witnessed at the same time the Indian Navy strengthening its presence along its eastern seaboard, the, um, in the Eastern Naval Command, uh, as well as on the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, on the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Um, so how do the Chinese view India's naval rights? So I found, um, in the course of many discussions of Chinese policymakers and academics, um, that issues pertaining to India's military modernization writ large are often um, somewhat summarily dismissed with a mixture of indifference and or disdain. In some cases, these sentiments appeared real, in some cases, they appear feigned, and in, in many instances, it was difficult for me to truly ascertain. But this perspective is far from universal. There is a vocal body of Chinese <coughs> naivalists that appear a lot less sanguine and dismissive of India's naval prospects. These hyper-realist thinkers frequently draw attention to India's naval expansion, which they almost systematically equate with what they view as New Delhi's hegemonistic tendencies in the Indian Ocean. Chinese commentators are particularly preoccupied by India's growing presence on the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, which they view as a potential future threat to their sea lines of communication. They also appear singularly aggravated by India's decision to take a firmer stance publicly on issues related to freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. I'm sure you noticed that last year in the US-India Joint Division Statement, there was a specific reference to freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. That's the kind of thing that annoys the Chinese. Um, perhaps one of the greatest threats in this sense is more ideational than military that of a counter-model in Asia, a democratic power that has begun to peacefully resolve its major maritime border disputes with its neighbors, such as Bangladesh, accepting to refer to international arbitration. This presents the international community a stark contrast with China, which continues to modify the status quo in the South China Sea and intimidate its smaller neighbors. The issue that concerns China the most in the long term, however, is India's development of naval ties with other democratic nations in the region not only the US, but also Australia, and increasingly Japan. Indeed, although most Chinese commentators appear to agree that India poses little threat alone, many view, it as a, many view it as a critical swing state that could lend considerable power to any anti-Chinese coalition, including the United States, Japan, or smaller nations. Chinese officials hold little faith in India's professed attachment to strategic autonomy, viewing it as simply a manifestation of duplicity or traditional real politique. China's strategic community also appears to be gradually shedding some of its traditional reservations with regard to overseas basing and, ex and expeditionary operations. So China's long-held and off-stated position is that Beijing will not engage in military expansion and that the establishment of overseas bases would violate China's five principles of peaceful coexistence. There appears, however, to be, to be a debate going on in Beijing over the continued wisdom of this policy, with arguments occasionally surfacing in public. 
China's 2013 defense white paper laid a new emphasis on protecting overseas energy resources and Chinese national abroads, which are, which are defined as one of the PLA's major military missions. And this was re-emphasized in the latest version of the defense white paper. Um, I quote what was written in the 2013 version was the following. Um, With the gradual integration of China's economy into the world's economic system, overseas interests have become an integral component of China's national interests. Security issues are increasingly prominent, involving overseas energy and resources, strategic sea lines of communication, and Chinese nationals overseas. And emergency rescues have become important ways and means for the PLA to safeguard national interests and fulfill China's international obligations. As China's interests around the world continue to grow and the Chinese Navy's deployments become increasingly extended, some Chinese analysts have begun to advocate very publicly a revision of Beijing's current basing policy and the shaping of China's future military presence in the Indian Ocean is naturally closely tied to this debate. So moving on now to Sino-US rivalry and the Indian Ocean. Um, for the past few years, Washington has accentuated its efforts to pivot or rebalance towards the world's new center of economic and geopolitical gravity, viewing American power as being underweighted in Asia while overweighted in regions such as Europe and the Middle East. In 2007, the US Navy announced that while it would remain a two ocean Navy, its focus would shift from the Atlantic and Pacific to the Indian and Pacific Oceans. Official documents have enshrined this reorientation in writing, announcing that 60% of American naval and air assets will be shifted to the Asian theater by 2020. Building a more solid partnership with India, and the Indian Navy in particular, is viewed as forming a key enabler of the US pivot to Asia. And I'm sure you'll have noticed that during the Indian Defense Minister's recent visit to Washington, there was a joint reference to the India-US defense relationship as being an anchor of global stability. Within the United States, a number of strategic observers have suggested that due to rising financial pressures, and growing global commitments, the U.S. should more actively pursue the empowerment of regional, democratically-minded allies or partners, such as India. In effect, the Obama administration has repeatedly and occasionally quite vigorously expressed its support for India's naval ambitions and its desire to see India emerge as a net security provider, not only in the, in the Indian Ocean, but also beyond. But despite Washington's recognition of the Indian Ocean as a zone of growing strategic importance, it remains unclear to me whether the United States has truly developed a coherent strategic framework for the region. Indeed, as of now, this intellectual process remains something of an ongoing effort. Part of the challenge, note someone like Ashley Tellis, is that the Indian Ocean has traditionally been viewed more as a zone between regions, or an inter-region, by American strategic planners than a truly unified area of operations. And the difficulties that American strategic planners encounter when trying to devise a more coherent strategic construct for the Indian Ocean are only magnified by the US government's fracturing of the region. This is true both of the Department of Defense, where the Indian Ocean is segmented between CENTCOM, PACOM, and now since 2007, AFRICOM, and at the State Department, where the Indian Ocean is split between the Bureau of South and Central Asia, uh, South and Central Asian Affairs, the Bureau of East Asian and Pacific Affairs, and the Bureau of Near Eastern Affairs. The United States is enhancing its military footprint in the region on the island base of Diego Garcia, as well as along the western coast of Australia. Indeed, one of Australia's greatest assets is its strategic depth due to its distance from continental China, as well as its own vast landmass. As American forward bases in the western Pacific become increasingly vulnerable to Chinese missiles, the Australian continent, with its solid infrastructure and local technical expertise, could fulfill an important role as a logistical hub and bastion for U.S. forces. But despite all these recent initiatives, the U.S.'s strategic attention and increasingly finite military resources are likely to remain heavily focused on ongoing events in the Middle East, or when it comes to Asia, on the waters and airspace east of the Malacca Strait. As incidents of friction and brinkmanship continue to roil the waters of, south and east of, the east, of the South and East China Seas, the Indian Ocean risks falling even lower in Washington's hierarchy of strategic priorities. So as a result, some strategic thinkers have begun to speak of some sort of a grand division of labor in the future, whereby India would ensure freedom of navigation and the continuous flow of seaborne trade in its own wider maritime backyard, while the United States would be free to deploy its forces elsewhere. Now, in a perfect world, such a division of labor would no doubt function. It would release the United States 
uh, from its strenuous commitments in the Indian Ocean and insulate to a certain extent India's maritime environment from Chinese encroachment by refocusing the minds of Chinese planners on the US-led alliance system circling its periphery. But in reality, however, it's highly unlikely that such a strategic division or compartmentalization could occur, as both China and the United States are going to seek to apply strategies of defense and depth and expand their military rivalry into the Indian Ocean. And that's going to have an impact on the region's strategic maritime environment. Indeed, China's continued investment in what military analysts refer to as anti-access and area denial systems has created new vulnerabilities for US platforms and forward bases. And this has considerably raised the risks and costs of American military intervention. And as China continues along this path, there's been an animated debate that has emerged in Washington over the nature and direction of US defense strategy in the region. The Pentagon has started for a few years now to explore various operational concepts uh, that aim at rapidly overcoming hostile battle networks and restoring freedom of maneuver within heavily contested environments. But a number of analysts have also called for more indirect approaches, uh, which go under various monikers, whether it's offshore control, maritime denial, and these choose to forego potentially escalatory counterattacks on the Chinese mainland to focus on alternative lines of operation in the wider the Pacific and the Indian Ocean in particular. And where all of these concepts of operation seem to concur, however, is on the perceived advantages to be drawn for engaging in extended maritime interdiction in the event of a conflict with China and blockading actions in the Indian Ocean region. So this debate has naturally been very carefully scrutinized and dissected in Beijing. And the result has been a heightened Chinese paranoia over the security of their sea lines of communication, particularly those stemming from the Indian Ocean basin. But even if such debates have not surfaced with such virulence in the American public domain, simply by virtue of its size, capabilities and patterns of deployment, the US Navy does pose a threat to China's energy supply lines. And even if it wanted to, Washington could not convince Beijing that it would never, under any circumstances, not try to take advantage of this potential vulnerability. And it's in this light, I think, that one must view a training exercise conducted by the Chinese Navy in the Eastern Indian Ocean last year. So in January 2014, over a period of 25 days, a Chinese action group composed of two guided missile destroyers, one amphibious transport dock, and an unreported number of submarines conducted a series of what was described by the Chinese state press as exercises, I quote, for joint submarine ship breakthrough of enemy blockade zones through the Sunda, Lombok, and Makassa Straits. So as China's naval planning increasingly focuses on choke point control and blockade disruption, it may seek to extend the frequency of its naval operations along its western as well as along its southern axes of approach. And this may lead to much greater friction with the with Indian naval units in the Bay of Bengal, which, as we'll see in a little bit, is also now viewed by Indian naval planners as their future nuclear submarine bastion. Growing fears over US-sponsored blockade operations in the Indian Ocean could also convince Chinese planners of the need to forward deploy on a permanent basis naval platforms in the western Indian Ocean and the Arabian Sea. So to conclude, what does all this mean for the region's middle powers, such as Pakistan, Sri Lanka, or Bangladesh? Now, Pakistan is something of a unique case because it's enmeshed within what can best be described as a proto-alliance of Beijing. And the naval components of the Sino-Pakistani military relationship has become increasingly important. In fact, as China seeks to help Pakistan continue to present a westward challenge uh, to Indian Sea Control, but this is something that I worked on and I'm happy to discuss in more detail later. But for Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, the situation, however, is a lot more complex. Both have close relations with both powers, as well as with the world's sole remaining superpower, the United States, and wish to maintain a degree of strategic autonomy. And this will require, naturally, quite a finely tuned, calibrated balancing act. And I'd be very curious to know from this audience, uh, during the discussion, how, in your mind, DACA can best preserve its interests and accomplish its strategic objectives within such an environment. I also wanted to end by noting the increasing role of other outside powers beyond China uh, in the region, whether in terms of investments or infrastructure development. Uh, Japan, for example, uh, maybe in the future um, South Korea when it comes to defense cooperation. The opening up of Myanmar has also presented a whole host of other opportunities and challenges, uh, which I'd also be curious to get the audience's perspectives on. And finally, I thought I'd just close by showing you these two graphics um, derived from a report from my uh, that was published earlier this year. 
So the Bay of Bengal is going to take an added importance in coming years due to naval nuclear issues. Um, India is developing the port of Rangili, that you can see there, uh, which is its future SSBN, or uh, Nuclear Ballistic Missile Submarine Port, along its eastern seaboard, and increasingly views the Bay of Bengal, with its deep, muddy waters, as forming a natural bastion for its naval nuclear deterrent. One can therefore imagine a much greater sensitivity on the part of New Delhi to submarine incursions in the Bay of Bengal in the future. And meanwhile, China is also moving forward with the strengthening of its own naval nuclear deterrent based in Hainan in the South China Sea. And, um, and several Chinese naval planners have also spoken um, of, um, of implementing a similar bastion strategy. And as you can see from this map, Bangladesh, uh, some of, a lot of Southeast Asia, and Myanmar find themselves right in the intersection or the maritime no man's land in between these two future SSBN bastions. Um, so with that thought, I'll, I'll stop there and I'll look forward to uh, the gentleman discussing his comments and uh, to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rahman, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, it is important for us to understand that as a key maritime nation, what are the imperatives for Bangladesh? We, as a Bay of Bengal nation, we occupy some of the most valued real estate access to the Indian Ocean through the Bay of Bengal. The situation is far more complicated now, given the background that Dr. Rahman has explained to us, and also given the fact that Bangladesh is about to emerge is deep support to a third country. And as you can know that there are a number of competitors internationally who are trying to eye at that possible construction of the deep support, either in Shanadia or in Paira. Wherever it is, it has a dual capacity role in which it is not only for economic use, it has a potential military capacity inbuilt into it. So we are analyzing the Indian Ocean area at the Institute from geopolitical, geostrategic and geoeconomic potentials. All of the three are of great value not only to Bangladesh, but to all the literal states. It is important for us to understand that the region's only international body, IORA, which is IORA based in Mauritius, has indicated that it wants to build a more stable, secure, and a prosperous Indian Ocean Rim area. And that is the summary of the Perth communique that came out in 2014. It is also important for us to understand that a number of other players are getting into the play. The chair of our has shifted from Australia to Indonesia. And as you all know, that in the Indonesian current presidency is extremely robust on its maritime strategy, announcing in the Indonesian language, Poros Maritime Dunia, or in translated English, it means that they want to have a global maritime access. So there is a new prominent player in the group. But we also take note that the US continues to be the strategic anchor and a stability provider in the Indian Ocean area. And the statement by Secretary Gates in one of the previous Shangri-Las that United States is not an outside power. He claimed that the United States is a resident Asian power and a resident Asian maritime power for the reason they occupy the sovereign territory of Diego Garcia. So there is a new debate going on whether the United States is an outside power or a resident power. The Bangladesh's case is also further complicated and gains prominence because Bangladesh Navy is about to become a submarine navy because we are acquiring two main class submarines from China, which will also entail us to build a submarine base. My naval colleagues here probably will be able to explain better than me, but the fact that we are acquiring submarine gives us a new equation, a new status. At the background, we also consider that the Indian Ocean area does lack a naval security architecture. <coughs> just like the lack of security architecture for the wider region of Asia Pacific. We are in the process of seeing a number of initiatives that have been taken in the area. We see that the only pan Indian Ocean organization with a number of member countries 
in Indian Ocean Marine Association, or IORA, that exists. We see a robust effort by the Indians in the islands with 35 member countries. We see a similar effort by Milan, another coalition of navies in the region. We also see a track two effort or a track one point effort in Sri Lanka in the name of the Gold Dialogue. We also see the similar kind of agenda in the East Asian Summit and also mention of similar agendas in the ADMM Plus of ASEAN. We have also taken up the issue of Indian Ocean with honesty and sincerity. Therefore, a number of players have entered the game, further complicating the scenario of the Indian Ocean area. But the main players who are playing the game in the Indian Ocean area is perhaps to start with India, with 144 vessels, a large navy. In its order of battle, it has aircraft carriers, submarines, expeditionary platforms, long-range maritime aircrafts, and also capacity for a network center capacity in naval warfare. So it perhaps has one of the largest presence in the Indian Ocean area and continues to build on that capacity. We also have Australia, who has a direct presence in the Indian Ocean area with key naval interest. We have the presence of France, for example, because it has forward deployment in Le Réunion. It has presence in Djibouti and Abu Dhabi. Some of the bigger players also coming to the play is Iran, for example. Iran has deep interest in the Indian Ocean area and has continued to exercise in various parts of the ocean. Pakistan is another major player. United States, as I explained to you, is, is the predominant major power in the Indian Ocean area and continues to remain so. The United Kingdom has also forward deployed in many cases with the coalition partners of the United States, but it is also through the five power defense agreement that it has continued to maintain its presence in the ocean area. But one of the biggest players coming to the play is China. China sees Indian Ocean as a key theater on which to, its power will rise. One of the reasons that Indian Ocean has become an area of key interest to major powers is that not many times in history, two rising powers are basing their power on a single sea. So that both Chinese and the Indians consider the Indian Ocean as a key strategic space on which their powers will rise. Therefore, we have to be extremely careful and very, very articulating, scrutinizing as to how the competition might shape in the coming years so that we are not engulfed into any of the rivalries involved there. China continues to maintain its naval task force, or CTF 525, with more than 25 ships and 10 groups. So it has a robust presence in the Indian Ocean area. Japan is another player. Russia is also eyeing the Indian Ocean as an area of interest to the Russians. But there's some time, United States, with its allies, has also exercised in the Indian Ocean area in the recent years. The Malabar Naval Exercise that brings together the five navies of the world, or the Democratic Five, has somewhat excluded the Chinese. So there has been strong resentment from the Chinese as to why China was not included in the naval exercise that was conducted by the Americans and the Indians under the Malabar series. And the Chinese strategic thinkers have also cautioned that they will never allow the Indian Ocean to become India's ocean. So therefore, we see a new strategic competition that is developing in the area that might inter intensify in the coming years. I also see there is growing interest of the BRICS nations in the area. So is the new EU maritime strategy that has come out in June 2014, which calls for open and secure maritime domain in the Indian Ocean area. Therefore, we also see a number of other non-maritime challenges or non-traditional challenges that face the area. One of the basic challenges that we analyze now in the area is the uh, maritime security challenges or the maritime terrorism security challenges, which is becoming very acute in many Indian Ocean areas countries. We have fortunately been able to stem the tide of piracy with combined effort of many maritime countries in the coast of Somalia and other countries. But Indian Ocean area has also got severe 
problems of climate change and environmental challenges. And there is also property de mentioned in the recently concluded COP in Paris. So it has tremendous challenges from HADR or disaster management capacities. It is also becoming a very favorite route for drug, people smuggling, and contraband smuggling that needs to be curbed. So we are also now seeing newer issues coming to the region in the form of blue economy, led by Mauritius and Seychelles. We need a far robust search and rescue capacity, and the weakness of which we found in the post Malaysian Airlines and the Air Asia Air Disasters, that the region lacked maritime capacity in terms of search and rescue. But particularly of interest to the region will be how the new Belt and Road or the new Maritime Silk Road is being shipped by the Chinese in the backdrop of the US pivoting towards Asia. The Indians also for a short while floated the idea of Mosul, but that has now died down. But the predominant concept on the table now is to see how the Chinese shape their new maritime silk route or the Belt on Road concept, which is, in my mind, one of the master strokes of that level maritime grand strategy coming in the coming years. So with that, very few comments and a very rich presentation by Dr. Isnada, I have the pleasure to open the floor. So you may ask questions or make a comment or give your opinion on an issue that has been raised by our speaker. Please feel free to raise your hand and identify yourself, and I'll give you the floor. Thank you. Yes, sir. Just wait for the microphone to go to you. Okay. My name is Sadiq Khan. I'm a Would you switch it on, please? Oh. <clears throat> My name is Sadiq Khan. I'm a I was just wondering regarding politics. Of course, Bangladesh is making a balance between India and China. But in the military field, I don't see that. I see that uh, particularly the Navy is acquiring all its uh, well hardware from China. And then it is only the Chinese who have access to the ports of Bangladesh, any port, they're building there. Indians have already been allowed recently by this government access to the port in Kitabong for commercial vessels to stop there. And then the submarine uh, fleet that we're having, so naturally the submarine base will be built with the Chinese. It's being built already, as I understand, by the Chinese. On the other hand, America is also helping Bangladesh Navy in building this coast guard. So I don't see any balancing there really. And I think, I, I saw in some, uh, so, well, in some articles by various uh, <coughs> strategy group, uh, well, different analysts of India, that they are showing concern about this. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take a couple of questions in a cluster, and then come back to the speaker for his response. Uh, Dr. Arthur Ramandia. <coughs> If you, sir, please introduce yourself for our speaker. Yes, uh, I'm uh, Dr. Atau Rahman. I'm uh, also chairing a institute called Initiative for Strategic and Maritime Studies. Uh, first of all, I must say that uh, you have made a very comprehensive presentation. And, uh, but I'm lost, you know, because you, it seems that you don't have any focus what you are talking. Because I can see that uh, you are talking about strategic jostling and naval buildup in the Indian Ocean. But first of all, we didn't get why, you see. So you didn't specify, you see. And the second, you did not make any assessment of uh, the stability or turbulence in the Indian Ocean in the future, in the long term, short term, or medium term you know, analysis. So you didn't have that any, that clear focus, you know, you relate that is jostling for power in the Indian Ocean. So that's my first uh, type of question. The second, you know, you can talk many things about the Indian Ocean, what's going on around, and you know, and, uh, but I think you, you did not stress clearly the perception of the various uh, strategic actors. You know, you said three different major perceptions were extra, you know, like US and China, extra regional power, sometimes quote-unquote, you know, 
uh, although you know in a global commons we don't say that they're extra regional powers you know, they're part of the ocean so the second question i think you know unless you know that what type of interest and motivations these little states have you know you can't really understand the ior indian ocean region or in the bay of bengal i'm studying the in, uh, bay of bengal and here i think uh, most important thing which I now uh, feel that we should study, you see, apart from this uh, U.S.-oriented uh, kind of security, uh, you know, competition or rivalry, is that how shall